the competition between all the good minicons. And we're back. <laughs> and we're back. So that's, that's really excellent. Um, so today we're talking about education in all its aspects and have a number of different talks and activities for you. And we'd also like your, your participation today. I put my remote control away, but I'll just press a magic button. Um, so in my talks later, I'll do a couple of activities. And one thing I'd like you to think about, because many of you might consider yourself programmers, I'd like you to play that little game along the way. So memorize that or write it down. It may look familiar to you. It may be familiar to you under another name. Just scribble down the rules and see if you can write me a little program that does that. OK? And there's a point to this. There really is. Um, the other thing I'd like to say to you is a, is a little puzzle. I'll give you that in, the, in, a, in a break later. OK? So first up, we have Roland Gesthuizen, who is my um, co- Co-worker? Co-worker, co organizer, minion, um, co-minion. I like that. Um, on this, uh, this mini-conference. And, uh, and Roland and I have known each other for years. He now works at Monash doing cool stuff. So this morning, we first look at the, uh, at the cool stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Got a tiny change challenge there. Um, we switch to my slideshow. I'll give you a challenge. Have you got, have you got the clicker there? Oh my goodness, just watch. Okay. I'll give you a problem. A couple with five sons goes on a picnic. Each son has seven daughters. How many people went on the picnic? A couple with five sons goes on a picnic. Two. Thank you. Why two? Well done. Yeah. Context is everything, and so is actually listing. It's a play on words. Um, there were babies and a few other things involved. You, you go, you're grinding through the maths quickly in your head, and you forget the original question. It's like the one that my daughter plays on me, where you're the bus driver, and you go here, and you go here, and then I have to give the name of the bus driver, and that was me. I'll give you the context for me. I was a research scientist who worked with Orica. I worked in the animal health, organic chemicals, and the explosives division. And I was looking for a nice, safe career change and made the move into education. This is 1975. And we've got the little tiny Sojourno rover, which is here on Mars. And believe it or not, it, although it was exciting for me, just making this animated GIF is what got people excited. And the sort of thing that we see now with lolcats bouncing around. And I remember giving a presentation at Geelong College. And it was a bit like Harry Potter, where you had to stand on and have your dinner set. So that, for me, was quite exciting. And for me, being able to engage with the technicians is something I've always had a lifelong appreciation of doing. So I'll give you a bit of a snapshot of what my school was. This is Westall Secondary College. Um, to the north, we've got this factory that made stoby poles, and um, lots of asbestos would blow off it in the summer. Um, we have um, school flags. Um, over 80% of the students in the school don't speak English as their first language. Now, I spoke Dutch, and ik kan mijn Nederlands praten. Niemand hier kan mijn Nederlands verstaan. So I was in a minority. Um, this is Alex. Alex used to work at the Volkswagen plant, which closed down. A lot of vehicle assembly plants are closing down in the area, and um, he was able to help me with a number of things you'll see. And as you look out of the windows of the school, it's the only school in Victoria with the unique position of having three electrical pylons on the corner. So as we look out the school windows, we can think of electricity. Now, Alex um, was good at salvaging things, and he would actually make um, from the various poles and bits and pieces um, the instruments. Now, I had a weather station to put up on the school here, and if you could recognize, those are bits and pieces of school desks that he's actually welded together. This was our technology department. That's all. That's all we had, a digital camera. And we guarded it. Um, that was the entire budget. And I had a project where we had to do something for ScienceWorks, and we made paper balances. What I found interesting was that when we engaged with the technology, it was kind of there. It was free. It was adaptable. Um, you might recognize Windows 95. 
But maybe you don't recognize this net meeting program. We were also the first to do some of the video conferencing in Victoria using some of this software and connecting up and looking for applications in the education sector. We were asked to come to ScienceWorks and showcase what we were doing. All we had was our digital camera. And I remember sitting there with the students um, showing off the, what we could make with it. And they're looking rather embarrassed with the paper balances and stuff. But the science minister at the time, who was Barry Jones, got really intrigued and said, this is good learning. Asked some really good questions about us and picked up where we were heading. We took our digital camera, which you could recognize here, and we connected it up to the internet. You can pick out the blue cable. We were also one of the first schools to build our own server, and we had our own streaming server using, I think it was Darwin, one of the real audio media streaming servers, and we broadcast on the internet the transit of Mercury across the sun. It was done using a standard pinhole camera. Because our school started with W, someone on the ABC promoted us to the top of the ABC list, and our school internet connection got hammered. But we made it onto the radar. This guy had noticed that we were on the internet and had a project for us, and so he gave us a buzz. And my principal said he's with NASA, you can't bullshit NASA. It sounded really serious, and it was like something out of the film Contact, where stuff started coming out of the fax machine for something we had to make that we had no idea. So we started making it, and it was this sort of sundial here. It's rather cute that the students have put tucks up in the corner there. And it was something to do with a uh, watching the sun shadow, maybe a student project. So we mounted it underneath our radar dish here. This was just opposite the server room, and we got this up and running. And as it was, the serendipity was, we'd accidentally stumbled across a project that NASA had sponsored with the Planetary Society, and we had suddenly become the Southern Hemisphere reference station for the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. Um, and, and this was only because of the accident of us being pushed to the top of a list for um, broadcasting observatories for planetary transits. So we had a lot of fun, a lot of laughs about it. Um, so did NASA. Um, can anyone spot the error here? It's 10 o'clock, and yet we're showing 11 on the clock. Ah, well done. I see I'm with some smart people here today. Thank you. So on the back of the rover is a sundial, and we we're actually part of a project which was comparing well, not really the sun, but getting school kids to think about the different planetary times in the planet Mars, which has an orbital period of around 23 or 25 hours. It's one hour difference. But over a fortnight, that would creep, and day would become night, and night would become day. So it was exciting for us. Um, we were invited up to the Tidbin Villa tracking station with the NASA education officer. Um, we participated with the Curiosity rover launch. Um, this is Deborah Vane. She's the mission director from the CloudSat mission who came down and was a bit gobsmacked and wanted to hear about this school that pretended it was a university. Um, and um, she showed us the different um, sundials and the other projects that were running. Um, she was fascinated. It was like a cargo cult because we had all these cardboard satellites hanging in the, uh, in the window there. And so she really got connected to that and said, you should see some of the models that we make. I just noticed the pizza boxes in the bin there, so you must have been celebrating. Um, and I was invited to give a talk at uh, NASA JPL about the uh, work that we're doing with um, space science with our students and the modeling. And the chap over here, it's his job to make these models. This is one of the models that I made uh, two years ago for my students. We took a cardboard car, uh, we added a Arduino control unit to it and a traffic system. This isn't just light sensing, it's actually trying to detect with the infrared controller what the vehicle in front's doing, indicating left stopping, braking and turning. And we're, I wanted to put the wires on the inside of the car, but because of the anniversary of the DeLorean and Back to the Future, the kids wanted the wires on the outside where they're meant to be, so that's how we made it. I'm now at Monash. I've had this history of teaching and education, and Monash have snatched me up into the STEM method area. And there are some big things that have been happening at Monash. Number one, um, I was really put off by the fact that um, the software that they were using wasn't really preparing kids for the real world. And one of the big pushes I've been doing um, was trying to include more free open source software. Um, I was passionate about the idea of actually putting in the minds of kids that it wasn't just a suite that we're bought into, there's a whole range of different things that we could be doing. And part of that includes the use of free open source software. So last year was the first time that we actually installed OpenOffice onto the computers in the education faculty. And 
the big change also was that we started writing into the Victorian curriculum. So now there's no reason that you can't actually be using that. Um, we hadn't written the um, senior IT curriculum with a particular database in mind. Okay. Um, we've made the switch to using SQL, and you're a big help with that with some queries I had last year. Thank you, Ian. But also um, Python having a real traction as an actual programming language that we could be using, and um, LibreOffice as well. Um, it, we don't have to do it, and it doesn't have to do everything, but it does enough to be able to us to assess, park, and move the students on. And for me, it's been empowering that I can actually do that with the pre-service teachers. Well, why would we be doing that? Can anyone guess? Why would it be important to teachers? You might choose to use a Linux system because it's free. You might choose to use it because it's free, as in something that you can change, develop, and you're not buying into perhaps a corporate license. For me, the reason was actually understanding that the world was a lot more complicated than Apple, Microsoft, Adobe, and the big boys. There are some other tools around that you could be using. And what was interesting was that a number of educators, good teachers, good IT teachers, are now retiring, and they're still writing curricula. And all of a sudden, they're faced with the prospect of buying into these big licenses. They're having a rethink about it. And because we've had these discussions now for maybe five, 10 years, um, it's starting to gain some traction um, amongst the education sector. It doesn't have to do everything, but it does enough for us to be able to move the ball forward and to work with it. And for me, as an educator at Monash University, being able to teach the pre-service teachers about these options is handy. Let's have a look at this picture here and compare it to this one. So what's different? Oh, yeah, OK, horsepower. Yeah, that's true. More horsepower. Better information in the first picture? Yeah, yeah probably a bit better information. But it depends if they're all reading the Murdoch press there <laughs> on their phones. Yeah. It's a good question, because quite often we'll criticise these people for not having conversations while they're standing there. And then the reality was there wasn't much conversation probably happening over here either. Um, I love that when the parents are complaining, we should take away all the kids' phones. Um, imagine if you ran up the street there and took away all their newspapers and said, just start talking. There's a time for everything, and there's a space for everything. Computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. And it's easy for some school teachers and principals and administrators to forget that because we get caught up with the, the hardware. The idea that um, if I just had an observatory, that'll be about teaching astronomy. No, that's just a vehicle for us to, to doing stuff. So, what kind of things are we doing in the education faculty? Well, this is one of the mixed reality um, setups that we have. Um, this is done with the uh, primary school teachers in the part of their training. Um, it's using some uh, VR apps. And you can actually pick up here a teacher who's actually drawing on a picture, colouring in something, and then the Mini Cooper would actually appear that colour. Um, it's not hard to imagine how you might code that, and it just begins to make you realise that you're actually an author and you're creator of this. The idea isn't so much to play around with the VR as it is for the students to reimagine themselves as authors and contributors rather than consumers. We don't have to play with someone else's toy, I can actually make the toy. And the maker movement has a close connection with some of the free open source stuff that's actually happening. And one of the projects I'm working at is actually set up some maker spaces at Monash. So a lot of this modeling that I'm talking about has been happening for quite a while. Um, you saw the satellite model that I showed you earlier and the cardboard satellites we're doing. Um, this one is a model solar house. It's a science kit. It's not a, um, a computer project as you look at it there, but the fact that you're collecting all of this data, you might pick up the, uh, the processor here and then have to ask questions about, how do I collect it from these sensors? Where do I put it? What do I do with it? 
it's a model of a house. How realistic is this model compared to a real house? Maybe put the sensors in a real house and have a look at the black body radiation and heading towards thinking about big data and how we might analyze it or big analysis. On the right hand side though, um, I've got another picture. Does anyone recognize the museum? Ooh, okay, Tasmania? Mona, thank you. And the Mona Museum? Yeah, that's right. And Mona is a great museum in Tasmania. This is, um, can you guess the, the background? The background, which painter that might represent the studio for? Pearl earring? Dutch, yeah. I'm only guessing because you've got the orange shirt on. You must be Dutch. Uh, I'll click on the link. Can I move on to the link? If that'll fire off. Will, will it break? New tab? Okay. It's better if you did this on your phone because then you get the haptic feedback from using your hand and having that move and you get that 3D illusion. Oh, it snaps out at you. This is something I've made. Um, I've got a small gallery. Um, it's a STEM gallery. Um, it has around 3.8 million views on it. They don't monetize this, so I don't get anything except um, credits or conferences about how many hits I get. Um, what the painter's done here is set up an easel in a way with these mirrors and lenses so that they can actually reproducibly paint. But in a way, they're reimagining the scene in front of them. And in a sense, you have the virtual reality of the painting. And so what Mona has actually done, um, they're encouraging other artists to come and reimagine from that backdrop what they see. And they're displaying these different paintings. So it's a modern interpretation on an old technique with a grand master. I'm going to come back to these fuse images because I've got a concern and it relates to what I'm talking about. I'd encourage you, if you have any questions, just to put your hand up and ask me. You don't have to wait to the end. So, at Monash, we're engaged with um, augmented reality. Uh, we have an engineering team that's actually sharing and collaborating some of the ideas. Um, on the right-hand side, this is a very simple model for the respiratory system. Um, this is by one of the medical staff. Um, this is actually quite a good model. It has its failings, and the failings teaches you a bit about the nuances of the human body. Um, I've been talking with some of the teams about some of the different models that we could put in place for students who are learning how to drive, or for teachers who are pre-service teachers um, who are looking to work. And the chap I'm actually working with um, has developed some of the augmented learning systems for nursing students. And I've got a wonderful setup at the top floor of the ACU building where, and it looks a bit like if you remember the film Monsters, Inc., where they do the monster training and the dummy in the bed sits up, yeah, well, they've got a whole ward like that and an ambulance, and it's quite scary. But um, these are good tools, if you do it the right way, for preparing people for um, working in a hospital. And I'm curious about how we can do this for preparing people to work in a school. So we've got some mixed reality that we're doing here. It's playful, it's familiar, it's fun, and the costs are falling. It's a chance for us to actually think about ways of engaging this it's a lot cheaper than it used to be. So these are my students here, and you can see all the different tools that they have. Um, we would like to think that the tools that the students are going to be using are device agnostic. Occasionally, you'll get a particular push from a manufacturer who wants to use their particular product, and that's hard. Um, but it's something that we're savvy to, and also a different form of media. I just took a photo of my desktop there. Um, although I consider myself to be an IT guru and I'm sort of mucking around with this stuff, I'm still scribbling in a notebook. 
It just have to be something I'm comfortable with. Does that make me less digital? So we need to be able to work with that. But the one thing that I do want to point out that we do aspire to is collaboration here. And I mean an authentic form of collaboration that allows something better to come out of the parts. And so that happens, I think it's Google Doc or Pages, but it, the idea is that um, we can actually begin to work collaboratively in a document. And that for me has been the heavy lifting I wanted to do, that I'm expecting that with these agnostic devices, we can collaborate and work on projects. In the VR space, that's hard to do. Again, I'll come back to that, there's an issue. I have a project called STEM in a Box. STEM in a Box is um, a bit of an intellectual exercise. If you could send a box out, but before I say, does anyone know what STEM is? Yep. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. Usually the, the school principals will rattle off what the letters stand and say, well, I got that one right. It's, it's more than the science, technology, engineering, and maths. In fact, the interesting things that are happening in the sci-tech area are not happening in science and technology and engineering and maths. They're actually happening between the letters. Like you pick up, and I was at the PyCon conference, and there was someone sitting next to me, and, and he pointed out that he surfs the human genome looking for oncogenes. So he's a data scientist and he's a biologist. But I wouldn't describe him as being a genetic engineer, and then I wouldn't describe him as being just a computer scientist. So bioinformatics is a very new discipline that comes out of it. And in the STEM in the box, we're trying to put in the hands of students the artifacts that might actually unpack that would let them see what it is they're trying to find. And it's an interesting project when I send out to um, groups around Australia a box and they unpack it and they say, what's this Arduino? What do I do with these LEDs? And they'll go through the instructions for making something or building something or asking some questions. And one of the things I put in is a set of cool, a Google Cardboard glasses. We're sending some boxes out to some indigenous communities at the moment. Just interested to see how that connects. Yep. It's, it's what we've been using and doing already. Um, it was a convenient way of putting, it's like the humanities, what's humanities? In a sense, it's a science technology discipline area. It's probably more now also a process, a way of learning that's problem based, that's anchored in the real world of what we're doing um, and tends to be interdisciplinary. Um, it's not just science, it's not just engineering. I mean, what's interesting of engineering is that we talk about STEM in schools, yet I don't see any schools that have jumped up and started an engineering at year nine. Um, but there are schools that are setting up maker spaces that are having a blended curriculum approach to so actually the teaching it. Approach, these are not separate things. The whole theme That's correct, yeah. Different. And, and there, there are some digital origins. The digital origins of STEM come back to the maker movement um, and that was encouraged by cheap electronics and people being able to hack that to do things and to make things. and. For now, we're looking at that tide now sweeping into schools. The difficult thing is that schools like to silo and they get this wonderful area and they don't quite know how to fit it into the school curriculum. The main message is it's all about what you do with all these things. It's not about knowing these things separately. There's no point in that. I, point with I agree with you. It's about what you do. And for that's the challenge that schools have. You might remember the Ken Robinson video where he was saying about we should introduce creative dance into schools. Um, well, we're keen to put maker spaces in the schools, but the scaffolding and structure of the schools makes it really difficult to do that. And when schools are assessment driven, that they're working towards a test, that ends up driving the activity. I'm glad you mentioned it because for me, I have a problem sometimes with some of the maths teachers that operate. Um, somebody made the whimsical comment that the maths teachers haven't moved beyond the steam age, that the moment the industrial revolution happened, that's where they stopped. And the reason for that was the pencil paper based assessment. I mean, I'd be nervous if I went to an accountant and he was working out my tax return and he just starts sharpening his pencil and do a bit of long division addition. But that's the reality. That's what the maths that we were kind of expecting people to work with. Now it has a place, but its place is as grammar is to literature and the great works of Shakespeare 
handwriting mathematical calculations and that numeracy is to the wonderful world of mathematics that is about asking questions about the universe and looking and modeling. So we've got a lot of challenges and schools are playing that catch up game and we're aware of it and we're making those changes but it makes many parents nervous. I'm going to the main part of the talk which is about the Monash interactive VR environment and you can actually go to the website. If you've got a computer, I'm happy for you to jump in and have a sticky beak. Um, Monash EDU MIVP. There are some good examples there about what we can do. I'm going to give you one journey that I took of a group of students. And this is an Australian first, possibly a world first. There are the technical specs. I'm going to ask you, can you see on that, how many monitors are in this room? How many widescreen TVs are in this room? That's right. <laughs> that's, that's one hell of a kick-ass room. Um, it could barely fit in this space here. Um, so you have an environment which is wrapped around with widescreen monitors. Um, and they're actually, they picked them to try and minimize the um, bezel on the edge here, which we can't do away with. So I've got this half a million dollar center at Monash University. And it isn't just an expensive center, it's rich in what it can do for deep immersion. They've done some research work and they've developed this head tracking system which allows you to stabilize the stereoscopic effect. One of the problems of moving around in a room like that, and it is a 3D room was being able to track where the viewer is and to center the information onto it. So we have a head tracking system here that we can use. Now, I wanted to actually bring my pre-service teachers into that space. And I don't mean physically into that space, I meant using a 3D camera to record them and then transmit it to them wearing the Google Cardboard glasses. And the challenge that I had was how to make all this technology work. We've done the bits, I'm not the first lecturer to do a broadcast in 3D. I'm not the first lecturer to actually um, run a class inside here. But I was the first to put all the bits together with David so that I was lecturing two students in 3D around Australia from inside a 3D virtualization environment. Let me get your head around that. We were saved by a rubber band and uh, some blue tech. Um, the last minute, we, things were falling apart and uh, that managed to rescue the project. So it was, uh, we've actually sort of immortalized those pieces there. This is the camera that we recorded in 3D. It's a standard Sony uh, 3D digital camera. Does anybody have one? Has anybody tinkered with some 3D recording before? Ah, wonderful. Just with taking photos or? Yeah, I have a wonderful um, past student called Neil Creek who does some stuff. You don't need a 3D camera. Um, I use the Cha Cha method for taking 3D photographs and I can put them on my home TV. Uh, we don't have 3D DVDs or videos, but we can certainly play them if you do it the right way. You've heard of the Cha Cha method? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, I get people to take a photo. If I wanted to take a photo of you all in 3D, um, I would take my camera, I would line it up here Take a photo, don't move, cha, cha. And that allows me to have the left and right images that I can stitch manually together. And there's some nice software to help you with that. These are the camera operators. Um, we're the guys who kind of put the bits and pieces together and uh, actually made it work. And I'm going to give you the actual behind the scenes, how it works and also the Linux control system here. Where's the mouse? Touch screen?
Oh, no, I think I'm about to do something else there. I've got no idea where the mouse is. Um, I'm on the wrong. Oh, here we go. Got it. No. And it has a 3D setup here, so it's actually capturing left and right eyes. And the information is actually going to this box over here, which is captured with some software that Twan has actually written here. And from the software, we now have it in this program. And actually, I use this one for um, doing some screencasts of my students' assignments. And the source is in fact this screen over here. So we're capturing the information on this screen, which is the left and right view of the camera, and we're going to be looking at here. You can see the camera view, the left and right eyes, and it's streaming onto the internet through here. And if you have a look here on uh, YouTube, you can actually see the same view, and that's actually live on the internet which means that uh, if you've got one of these uh, Google Cardboard glasses, it'll give you the left and right view. And having a look at the phone here, from uh, when the phone is actually in, you'll be able to see the left and right view of the display here. So this would be placed inside the uh, Google Cardboard, and it has the left and right view for the eyes here. And that's how we're going to work the information from the real world to your virtual world. I just find it ironic that we have here a half million dollar center and I'm using four dollar cardboard glasses. But it's what we do. Oh, thank you. Oh. Monash University is Australia's largest research intensive university. Thank you. Good. So the software that you heard me using was called Open Broadcast Software. It's free, it's open source, and what's really good, we can adapt it to what we want it to do. Um, we can easily write the actual profile that allows us to capture from the 3D camera and do the mixing that we need to stream it out just directly on the YouTube. Um, when the students place the 3D, when they place the goggles on their head and they've got the glasses in, it's able to work through. Um, with some of the headsets, we've discovered the problem that where do you put the audio? And if you're wearing the actual um, earpiece, um, although we have metadata for the video, we don't have metadata for audio. And so um, left and right, if you're turning your head around, that's correct, yeah. And so we're actually now thinking about rewriting that standard so that we use a three microphone input and then it does an auto mixing between the three microphones here to pick out where you're facing and then give you that particular stream. So with three streams of audio data, we could actually then give you the audio information that you need for the direction that you're facing. And it changes the whole experience. Correct. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the back end there. But as you heard me saying, standards, because there aren't many standards that have been written about this. I'll come back to that in a moment. This is what the broadcast looked like. Um, it's a standard broadcast. We did it with a, a banner here to hold, and then it split into the left and right channels. You could have just seen that there. Um, and we did it using YouTube. Um, we've tinkered with the idea of perhaps doing it ourselves. It just happened to be convenient. That was one problem. We didn't have to reinvent about the streaming. So we got that up and running. Um, it's interesting when you look at the actual narrative there. We hadn't anticipated some of the problems that the students had. Um, look at the right-hand side. Um, that's one of my students around Australia. Um, she was having fun doing it. Um, unfortunately, the kids had run off with the lenses out of her goggles. They thought they were fine. You could sort of pop in like molecules and run around the house. and 
burn Antelim maybe. So it was a bit, um, we had a number of technical issues we're trying to solve on the fly, as well as actually trying to explain how to engage in the 3D environment. This is one of the 3D visualization walkthroughs. I'm going to now switch to this video by David, and this is where he's actually in the center, and you get to see what it looks like. Oop, up. see as I move, the 3D environment moves. So this is to me as if I'm looking at a great panel of windows. That's the surface of Mars. Um, um, it's, it's a classic one used for training and like a test pattern. You look at it from one point and that's your... And you can actually point. step into so the lines, Gustav crater. These little dots on the and front. then if you lower yourself down to about two metres, you begin to look at it from a profile for someone walking on Mars. Up closer to the camera. These dots are tracked by the red camera. And you can see here the headset unit that the operator actually has to wear. Now, because the camera is the point of view, we had to put the headset on the camera. You can see the visualization on the screen move. Can you see it moving it around, so how the screen behaves? The ability in immersive visualization, the ability to track the user. Now, what we're doing today is because there are people at home looking at this in 3D, we're leaving these glasses attached to the camera. Um, so I'm just going to put them back on there, and we won't be really using that uh, much more today. Let me see if I... So, I'll explain this picture here. Um, it's an NMR scan of a newborn rabbit that's taking its first breath. And that's really powerful if you're in the medical area because for the first time you begin to look at some of the physiological changes that happen at the time of the birth of a baby on how it fills its lungs and how the respiratory system begins to kick in. It's a moving image in 3D. It allows us to gain an appreciation as to what's happening in the body and it's floating in front of me, and I'm actually pointing it out and walking around it with my students. And they're looking at it from around Australia, asking questions and engaging and then collaborating with me sitting inside there. Now, David's the one who really flies this stuff. Um, I'm the teacher educator, and he's the skilled senior PhD lecturer who's actually working on this, and I'll give him full credit for it. He also gave me another picture here I'll show you. And this one here is what the broadcast looks like from their side. So I'll play that now. I'll make no apologies. You're not wearing the cardboard glasses. You could cross your eyes and look at it cross side. Um, we had the same audio problems that these chaps were having. We didn't set the audio levels right. We didn't test it properly. And it ended up being clipped, which we've had to clean up. So what you're hearing isn't quite what they would have heard, but um, it's what we've managed to salvage from the recording. While I'm, pass while I'm playing that, I'll pass around the uh, cardboard glasses. So, um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the, the system we're in and what we use it for at Monash, but also run through some demos. Um, so, actually, what we'll do first is quickly go through this one that's up on screen, uh, and then I'll, uh, you'll be tired of looking at that, so we'll bring something else up while I talk about the system. So, this is a 3D visualization of Mars. I'm putting my glasses on here so that I can see it in 3D, and the camera we have here is recording in 3D and streaming that to you, uh, hopefully. Um, I'm probably going to be a bit of a silhouette. You want me to keep walking over? I'm getting stage directions here. So, um, uh, 
what we can see in here, all of those in the cave have their 3D glasses on, so they're seeing a different image in the left and right eye, which gives the stereoscopic effect. And hopefully that's uh, translating to you with your Google Cardboard on. Uh, Could you make a photo of so, that? Uh, what we're looking at here uh, is a, a historical data set of Mars, so Global Surveyor orbited Mars for many years, and it took three years to radar range the surface. So we have the, uh, we have the depth map of Mars here, and what I can do is, um, if I can wake up my controller, is, uh, is fly down um, and have a look at Mars. Now, people in the cave might find this a little bit disconcerting, um, and hopefully it I'm getting close to the end here. This is the field of jars in Peru. And what David's been experimenting with is using drones to actually crisscross over an area. It's an archaeological dig. The place is littered with landmines, so you don't want to go walking there. The locals know where the landmines are, usually where they don't cut the grass. And then once you've done that archaeological survey using a drone, you can then actually concatenate that information and do the necessary computational processing to create a 3D landscape that you can walk through. And that's exciting. It means now that we can begin to gauge virtually. It's not done with LiDAR, it's just done with conventional drone technology. And the teaching of it, you just need to have these 3D visualization viewers and I can engage a wider archeological community in perhaps the process of that dig. And there are all sorts of wonderful things you begin to do in that immersion facility. And because I can actually add time as a variable, I can actually wind back and wind forward the dig and look at the different soil profiles as I'm perhaps digging out a skeleton or perhaps the jars. Or in the case of a quarry, if I was to do this in a quarry and then I actually subtract one data set from the other, I can begin to see the points of failure in the quarry where there might be some land slippage and there might be a hazard that might have come up. Again, using a drone that's doing a survey, concatenate. Now I'm talking about a lot of processing of data to get that one right. So, we're currently exploring a couple of areas. This is me playing around with some of the 360 tools. We want to look at ways that school kids can actually engage with it, we'll be able to capture it and share it. Um, these are a couple of hundred dollars a piece. Um, some of them are device bound. Most of them do some really cool stuff. Um, and this is something I made on my phone this morning, just walking up to the conference venue. Um, I want to thank the team that actually put the work together. It's David and Tun, Daniel, and Andreas, and especially my class of uh, EDF 5303 students who made this possible. If I want to teach people everything they need to know, the best thing is for me to actually put them in a place where they can find out what they need to know and they can ask the right questions. I didn't have to teach them everything about open source. I didn't have to make Python coders out of them, but making them aware of it by placing them in a place where they could ask questions and then move forward and understand what free and software just doesn't mean you're paying for it, it's because of the way it's been built and freedom of thinking and able to change. Now, I've got a couple of questions and I've been listing them for this talk. and I'm going to go through them now. Where are we going? What do I want to do with this? I mean, who's going to drive it? Will it be these major corporations or would it be hobbyists or is it going to be enthusiasts like me? Who's going to generate the content? Will the students be doing it? And what standards do we follow? The wonderful fuse you saw me doing with the 3D stuff is vendor locked in. It is really cool. 3.7 million views. I have some ownership on this thing, but we don't have any standards for it. And I'm a lot allowed to take the data and the metadata out of that system. So where does open education fit into that model? I don't have the answers for that. And I'm hoping today at this mini conf that we can because we're screaming for that kind of stuff and we need people like you that have a really sensitive appreciation to how this fits in and how to help me move it forward. So if you want to talk to me more about it, love to. Remember, I am a teacher first and um, a coder second, um, but I'd love to hear some of the thoughts that you might have so I can take that and help maybe teach the next generation of pre-service teachers Thank you very much.
Um, does anyone have any questions you want to ask? Or yes. Which one? The uh, the 3D kit, the glasses. Sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I'll repeat the questions for the audience. So you're asking? Can I ask you to repeat the question again? Ah, uh, that was, yeah, the stem in a box. Lots of components which um, had a model of a house. And that's coming up in the curriculum this year. It's coming up as a curriculum resource. Um, if you contact me off list, I can send you some information. I'll be honest with you, I buy a cardboard box and I fill it up with stuff from JCAR. Um, the question, though, for teachers as we're building it is what do we put in? Because that says everything about the issues and the values that you might have and also the, maybe the gender prejudices you might have. For the students, though, it gives them empowerment about thinking this isn't something I can do at school, I can take it home, it's mine. Um, what surprised people at Monash when they said that um, my budget was a couple hundred dollars, they thought that was it for the box. No, I actually bought all the boxes, about 24 of them for that. Um, it's just blew everyone out the water how much the price has changed. So there's an economy lesson in it as well. But if you contact me afterwards, I'll give you my business card, I can uh, involve you in that. Anything else? Thank you very much.